There you go, man. Have a seat. Hey, um, hey, this ain't that kind of show. Get to your seat. How y'all feel? Turn, turn on my mic. Check, check, check. Can you turn it up, please? I'm losing my voice, please. Turn it up, please. Thank uh, you. All right, thank you, thank you. You're losing your voice? A little bit. A little bit? Can we turn it up a little more, please? Hard, please. Man. Can we turn it up a little? Is it loud? Yeah. Is it really loud? <laughs> Y'all, hey, you know what? You haven't figured out the comedian is messing with you right now? Check, check, check. Can, hey. it, can they hear me? Oh, I can't hear myself. Oh, here we go. How you doing, man? Man, I'm doing fantastic. New York City, baby. What up, baby? <laughs> New York City, man. Man, you used to come around that end on them. Well, you know what? You, the other day, I'm in L.A. Yeah. on Friday, yeah. and I had a chance to stop by your show. Yeah. And I know you, you said something you didn't think I heard. What was that? Because I'm taking a picture with you and Odell Beckham Jr. was yeah. there. And you said, yeah, let me get this picture with two, two giants and a cowboy. You're what? a cowboy fan, man. I'm a cowboy fan. Ain't nothing wrong with what? Hey, watch your tone and <laughs> watch your tone and your delivery now. <laughs> but yeah, but, but we haven't been, we haven't been to the dance in a minute, so it's, it's it's all good. But but the one thing I do do is that the Giants we always appreciate the competition yeah. and the people that play on the Giants. It's always you know that competitive spirit. But you know at the end of the day, I am from Texas. <laughs> so. Well, I got you. You've always shown me love. I will say that. And, uh, and, and you know what? And it's, return, it's mutual. It's well, that's mutual, great. Mutual that's great. And, and the fact that you guys you came by and, and showed that love and energy, when people saw you, they just lit up. And that's what it was all about. It was really great. Well, you know, people always light up when they see you because, um, as we said, you, you have that personality where you enjoy life. Yeah. You walk in the room. You're one of the people when you walk in the room, people are happy you're there. Yeah. You're not happy when you leave. That's <laughs> important. <laughs> Well, you know, because we were talking about this the other day. It's like, you know, we, I was telling you about working on Robin Hood. Mm -hmm. So we just got through working on Robin Hood. We were in Budapest for like nine or, or six months. And you just look at your life and you go like, man, you know, it's really good. So you always have to keep that smile on your face and just be like, man, it could be so different. I think about what my grandmother did. My grandmother, you know, they pick cotton. Yeah. Man, I mean, you know, they had a real job. I mean, my grandfather would get up at five in the morning you know, go mow somebody's lawn and and all that kind of stuff. So when I'm doing what I'm doing and they tell me, do you want the right kind of avion or rice? I don't care if it's tap water. I just want to enjoy, you know, what I'm doing. So every time I go, I just think like it's just another opportunity to to, to do something great and put smiles on people's faces. Now, it, it's very hard to figure out what, what to start with you, where yeah. to start, like what to talk about, because you've done it all. So we're going to start about with your latest project. Yeah. Beat Shazam. Okay. Well, then, so, so, so I want to... Yeah. We, I use Shazam. Yeah. I can't beat Shazam. You, you You're giving away a million dollars for somebody who can beat Shazam. So where did the idea of this show come along and why did you want to host it? Well, here was the thing. We've been, I've been trying to get back to TV for like three years with this idea. And I, I was jealous. Kevin Hart had his show on TV. I'm jealous. Uh, 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 J-Lo has a show on TV. I'm jealous. The Rock got a show on TV. I'm jealous. Everybody got a show. This show is perfect for me because it's music. Uh, and it's giving out money, and it's and mm -hmm. and, and and that's that's always a cool thing. I remember name that tune. I don't know if y'all remember. I remember. Remember name that yeah. tune. Can you turn this up. Can you turn it up a little bit, just for me, please. I I remember uh, name that tune. So that was the key element of the DNA. But then when they added the 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 app part, the Shazam part, mm -hmm. it really made it dope. So Mark Burnett, who, you know, of course, that's Survivor, oh, that's, yeah. that's, that's uh, 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 The Voice, mm -hmm. and then a, a young man named Jeff Aploff, who created uh, Beat Shazam first and then got with, with Mark, and then we all got together. We was like, how could we make this show like none other, where we have great contestants, but at the same time, I'm hosting and sort of having a great time and bring, bringing people to stop by. And so once we finally got it together, we took it to Fox and they okayed it. Then it was trying to master the game show. Now, I've done movies. Because I do a game show. It's tough. It's tough. 
It's tough. I'm sitting there like. You want, you want to play, but you need to know what's going on. Exactly. <laughs> so that's why I said, right? Yeah. Well, I'm playing and ha ha ha. Google will look at me. Just, and then, hey, hey, hey. Listen, you got to buckle down and know what you're saying because <laughs> you done gave money to people that didn't play and you done, <laughs> you done gave people the song. So, so I really had to buckle down, learn how the format was, and learn that it's three teams. Uh, that, that are going to battle against each other to see who's the fastest at recognizing the hot hit songs. Mm -hmm. Each time they, whoever answers the quickest gets the money. At the end, one team will remain and will take on the app Shazam, and if they could get five songs or six songs in a row, they win a million dollars. So with that in mind, it was a great journey because once we got the contestants, that's when it, that's when it lit up. Because these were people from regular everyday America, uh -huh. not like how we're used to large sums of money. These were people like, if you think about it, had I not made it, like I remember going like, how could I rustle up 200 bucks to get someone? How could I rustle up a hundred dollars? I got to pay, you know, I got to get my you car like rated. You feel rich fixed. if you had a hundred dollars. Yeah, like I remember my alternator when I was like, oh man, what am I going to do? You know, I go to Pet Boys, yo, let me get it and then I'll put it in. And don't worry about the service charge. I said, well, we, this costs out. Well, give me the one that somebody used. Give me the used, used one. And then I'll put that on there, and I'm smelling like, I smell like gas my whole life. Because <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. But so it was, it was those type of people. And what we found out was when we started doing it, no one played for themselves. Mm -hmm. Lady said, I'm playing because my mom lost her house in a fire. I was like, ah. Then uh, one, one guy says, listen, uh, I need medical benefits, and my friend doesn't have medical insurance and suffering from this, so I'm playing for that. And then what was a, what was a reoccurring theme was uh, student loans. Yeah. Got, one, one kid was like, I need my student loan paid for. Eight, eight, probably ten of the people that we had needed to pay off student, student loans, which let me know we got a definite problem with that. But when the father and the son, yeah, that's right. She's like, mm, I'm paying right now. <laughs> yeah, she's like, I, I'm still paying, I'm paying on mine right I, now. But I got this new bag, though. No, I'm just <laughs> Yeah, you got, oh, yeah, okay, student loan. I see, I see that you loaning to Louis Vuitton, baby. <laughs> yeah, but I got this. I had to have this bag, Jamie. But, but, but. But you know, you, speaking of which, though, you 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 do have fun at the show. I've seen, a lot I've of seen fun. clips. I've seen Snoop there dancing with um, October Gonzalez, October who you Gonzalez. work with, beautiful, who, who is is on the show with you, yes. kind of a, a little co-host. She is the wife of Tony Gonzalez, soon which to be is, Hall of Fame tight end. Yes, for the, which was so sad when I found that out. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. But, but she she can sing as well. Okay, is it okay? They hear you. Check. Can you just put for me? Okay, cool. Because I can't hear me. That's what. <laughs> You're not supposed to hear you. We're okay. supposed to hear All right, you. So you can hear me. Clearly. We can hear you. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, we gonna get so, to some of that. Those so, impressions. So, so what happened was, so she's on the show. But I, I want to finish this story up about the student loans. So the guy, the the kid. They're playing for a quarter of a million dollars, mm. and they win. The kid says, I could pay off my student loans. The father starts crying and says, I can now put my babies, my three little girls, through college, Jay, and you made this happen. And we didn't anticipate that. And it was, you know, I started, you know, I was like, hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm Keep trying to be tough, but I was like, Shh. and so... You know, that happened. And then another lady was playing for $346,000. She said, I've never seen this kind of money. I could pay for my mom's stuff and this and the other. If I, and it was like, if she goes for it and she gets to 346, it'll be great. And I, her husband, she was from New York. She was like Jersey or something, little tan little lady. We call her Miss Tan Lady because she's really tan. And she had the voice and she was talking and the whole. And she says, oh, my goodness, I've never seen money like this in my life. And, and I said, are you sure you want to go for it? And she says, well, her husband was annoying. Ralphie, what should we do? And Ralphie said, it's okay, honey. You know what to do. Go get it. Make it happen. <laughs> you know how to do it, baby. They, you they know really the sound like that? Yeah, really sound like this. When you see it, it's crazy, right? So, so she goes for it. She wins it. And Ralphie, who was a tough guy, boom, crying. 
runs out, picks her up, and says, I cannot believe you just changed our life. Yeah. And then the last story is when someone won the million dollars. Now, that was a little different because it was a, a young couple, and, and she'd been saying, like, yo, I really want him to marry me. That's what I want. I want a ring. I'm playing because I want a ring. And I'm like, yo, you don't want to marry her? He's like, ah, Jay, come on, let's just play. <laughs> <laughs> and but that was at the beginning. He's like, Jay, you know, I'm just trying to. So even a commercial, like, yo, money be cool. Like, you know, if you want to on the show, you could ask it because, you know, you never know what might happen if you mm -hmm. win the big money. <laughs> Plus, she's answering all the questions. <laughs> I'm telling you, put that ring on the finger before she becomes a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> money, when I tell you she goes for the million, and money. I was like, do you realize in five seconds, in five, because, because Shazam can answer, can identify a song within five seconds. I said, listen, within five seconds, you can be in another tax bracket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you can literally be like, how much I got to pay? Yeah, FICA, what is that? It'll be all of that, right? I said, you know what FICA is, right? <laughs> what the hell is FICA? <laughs> Why they get all my money? Anyway, so... so <laughs> <laughs> I always look, I said, FICA is really cashing out on me right now. Uh, so she goes for money and wins. She wins the million dollars. We go crazy. Everybody crying. He crying. And immediately, m the money changed him because she was like, <laughs> I said, you still want to get married? She's like, I mean, yes. We'll t I mean, we'll get there. <laughs> we'll <laughs> She, she, she's like, yo, 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 yo. She said, yeah, I, I, I do, but she jumped in my arms. Jamie, <laughs> what are us millionaires doing tonight? <laughs> and you know me, I'm like, what's up? <laughs> no, but it was, but it was, it was, but it was a, it was a earth shattering moment that you didn't anticipate. We anticipated it, mm -hmm. but not quite to that degree to where. It's so much fun. And I had to learn not to judge a book by its cover. Yeah. Because you know me, I look and I see the brother. It was a brother, it was a contestant, and the hip hop category came up. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> looking at that money, dog. <laughs> right? He didn't get any of it. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, yo, you know what this is, right? That's Nelly. You know who Nelly is, right? Right? But he got all the country western. Yeah. He got all, listen, he got all the country west, and I said, yo, how do you know country? He says, man, uh, Jamie, uh, when I was a kid, uh, the bus driver, I was like, in, in fifth grade, my bus driver listened to country music, so that's how I got my country music. I said, damn, all right, cool. And then, I promise you, it was an elderly white lady from South Carolina comes out, and she's dabbing. No. 63, 63 years old, dabbing. I said, what is it? She ended up winning the hip-hop and the R&B categories. Killed it. And I said, how you know about hip hop? Well, Jamie, down there in South Carolina, some of my best friends are of color. <laughs> I said, what? They of the color, Jamie. And it was, it was so wrong and so right because, you know, that was just her life. She didn't know that she was probably offending me a little bit. But it was great because I'm from the South, so I understand that Jamie, some of my best friends are of the color. <laughs> so I had to learn not to judge nobody because everybody's idea uh, or everybody how they got music was completely uh, uh, amazing, man. And it was, like I said, it was a week of shooting three shows a day, but every single show was something special. You talked about Snoop. I do a thing on the piano. Mm -hmm. I get on the piano on the show. This was the wrinkle that we add. I said, sometimes I want to get on the piano and sing a song and be like, yo, this is a magic piano. Sometimes when I sing on this piano, the artist might come out. So at one point I'm singing, I said, uh, uh, I, I said, uh, 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 beautiful. I just want you to know you're my favorite girl. Right, and I'm singing that, but then they surprised me because that's actually a Snoop song. All of a sudden, I look behind me, it's smoke billowing up. I don't know what, <laughs> I don't know where they got the smoke from. <laughs> and Snoop comes out, and the place goes up in flames, and he came, to, he came well, I mean, literally. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, Snoop came out and, and everybody went crazy and then as they tricked me and had, as opposed to pop, hip hop, uh, country hits, they had Snoop's playlist. 
So now the contestants have to guess or identify Snoop's playlist. But Snoop threw a boomerang to him. His first song was Devil Went Down to Georgia. Oh. And everybody was thinking some hip hop and things like that. So he threw him a loop. And so that was fun. And then uh, Terrence Howard came out. Terrence Howard from uh, um, Empire. Empire came out. Yeah. What's going on with you, man? <laughs> What's going on with Shazam, man? I see you, Jamie, man. <laughs> Man, I'm coming down there to do your show, Jamie. Man. <laughs> so, so he came out, and I was actually doing, they got me again. I was actually doing an impersonation of him, and he comes out behind me, and he says, man, what you doing, man? I said, I ain't doing nothing, man. <laughs> and so he came out, his playlist, he had something from, like, Frozen or something like that, <laughs> which was crazy to see Lucius, you know, <laughs> you know, with some, uh, like, really nice, yeah. nice dainty, Lighten like, it. you know, animated songs, and he actually sung it and performed it. Which I'm like, I said, I know it's a brother at home. You know, I'm thinking he's hustle and flow. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? I'm waiting to whoop that trick, you know. <laughs> I said, Terrence, I know some black people turning on the television right now. Man, what is Lucius doing right now? <laughs> but uh, he came out, and then the, the most spectacular moment was I called Mariah Carey personally. I said, Mariah, this show really needs your touch. Because when you talk about iconic music, you are the one. And I said... She said, Jamie, do you want me to sing? You know, I said, listen, I don't want you to do anything. I just want you to show up. Because she was really burned by social media and how people try to, you know, I, I don't dig that part of the social media where everybody's na 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 na. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I said, this is a lady who put so much work in all these years. She's given us all these iconic songs. I said, I guarantee you I'm going to protect you. I don't want you to sing one note. I said, but there are some people, there's some fans here that would literally be over the moon if you walked out. And she says, please. I said, I got you. I promise you. I talked to Fox, everything. I'm going to set the piano up with, with candles, the whole nine, and you're not going to sing a note. And when I was joking during that show, I said, give it up for Justin Timberlake. And it wasn't there. You know? So people thought I was joking. I said, ladies and gentlemen, Mariah Carey. And they were like, Jamie, please. And she walks out. And the place went nuts. And the two contestants who loved Mariah Carey started crying. And, 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 a, lot, and, a lot of crying going on. Bro, it was crazy. <laughs> I cried. I mean, I, you I, crying? The contestants I crying? Cried a little, I cried a little bit. I'm emotional anyway, though. But when them dudes saw Mariah, and, and they just started crying, I said, can I hug you? And she hugged him. She sat there on the piano. I said, you're not going to do nothing. I want people to celebrate you. One of her songs came on. They, uh, they guessed it, and then she walked off. But that really put the show somewhere special. Yeah. But you know, you get people like that to show up because everybody respects you, loves you. That's why you get that support. Yeah. And, and, but it seems to me that giving away money and helping people seems to be the best part about the show for you. It, it literally is. No matter, I told them no matter what the bell or the whistle is, the main thing is the people. When they leave that place, people will leave leaving with 183000 quarter of a million dollars, then a million dollars. And the people at Fox were like, Fox, stop. I was going to say, from... <laughs> we about to, Fox, you about to start paying them out your check. Yeah, from experience, it's great to give away Network's money, right? Yeah. Not yours. <laughs> it's awesome. I love it. <laughs> give him $100,000. I don't care. It was crazy. But you, you mentioned Name That Tune. What were some of your favorite game shows growing up? I mean, you got it. I mean... Uh, uh, Hollywood Squares was amazing because yeah. you got a chance to see, you know, some of your favorite, you know, people mm -hmm. that, that were in the square. I remember um, you watching Soupy Sales, and you know, this back. Y'all too, y'all too young. To remember Soupy Sales? <laughs> you know, I mean, so black don't. Oh, uh huh. She's a black don't crack baby. <laughs> uh, but but Hollywood Squares was amazing. Uh, 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 Twenty thousand dollar pyramid. Um, yeah. Uh, it's uh, uh, two, uh, it's two of them. Uh, yeah, <laughs> elephant out of the past. Uh, okay, this is uh, you sit at home with the uh, uh, go go past. Uh, and, uh, what was it? Uh, chocolate milk. You know. It was that, <laughs> but tr trust me, that still happens. Oh man, still happens. you know what I mean. So so all of those game shows were like you know like embedded in in, in me. And then again, you know. Uh, it was some of your greatest comedians and greatest mm -hmm. people that were doing those game shows. So it's sort of like that's the that's the new new right now. But but it's crazy. You're doing this show. It's about music, but and I I don't know if anybody if most people know this, but you as a kid, man, you were a classical pianist. Yeah. Your grandmother made you study classical piano. Yeah, it it was crazy because like, I was adopted. My grandmother adopted me at seven months, and my my adopted brother played the piano. 
and I'm like five, and he's like 15, and I would see him play, and girls would just go crazy when he played. I said, hey, I'm doing that, whatever he's doing. <laughs> And uh, my grandmother said, yeah, you know, you got to learn classical piano, though. You know, so I was like, why? She said, because it's going to take you across the tracks. And when she said that, I thought she meant, like, you know, our town, small town in Terrell, the white side was separated from the black side with the railroad tracks. So the north side was the white side. I said, you mean I'm going to be able to go across the white side of tracks? She said, no, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. You're going to be able to take your music all around the world. So I want you to learn how to play classical piano. So she got a lady from uh, Dallas, Texas, who was like 28 miles away from my little town, uh, Terrell, Texas, which was only 12,000 people in my town. And she said, listen, I don't have money to pay you, but I'll get you students. And you could use my house and my piano. I had this old piano. So she would let the lady come down on a Saturday. I would get a free lesson, and then she'd have like 10 or 15 students mm -hmm. where she would make her money. So uh, God bless N Lanita Hodges, who taught me how to play. And, you know, I went on from there, you know, learning how to, you know, I learned how to play. Like Lionel Richie was the thing at the time. So mm -hmm. in the eighth grade, I knew how to, hello. Isn't me you're looking for? I can see it in your eye. And I even had to curl. I was I gonna to say. <laughs> I was gonna. I I remember the pictures with the yeah. Jerry curls. I'm oh, like, yeah. oh, you went full line. Oh yeah, I, I had to. I called. It was a California curl. <laughs> see, it was different. The Jerry curl was just all the same roller. I had the low roll in the front and then the big roll in the back. <laughs> so it's like it's low in the front but long in the back. It looked like a Z28. You know what I'm saying? It was like. No, so, and, and then once I learned how to do that and sing and the whole nine. You got a scholarship. I got a scholarship to United States International University, and it was 81 different countries that were represented at that school. And that was mind-blowing because I came from a town where it was just black, whites, and Mexicans, and now here I am, people from Argentina, child prodigies from Japan, and we were all connected uh, in, in music. And so it was just a, an incredible ride. But what was, what was cool about my upbringing, though, I also played for the church. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would get off the book, you know, and there were, at this place uh, in my college, there was this place called FA 300, where there's all these different pianos. So I'd go into some church and some jazz, and, and so they would always listen in. Like, what, is, what is that? I said, yo, man, it's a church, man. You know, hallelujah. You know, I sing all these different things. So when I, when I got, got to that college, man, everything sort of like jump started from there. Well, how do you go from classical pianist, um, you know, singing, yeah. church, yeah. college, yeah. to comedy? I was always a clown. I was, I was always a clown. I was always clowning in school. I remember in the third grade, Ms. Reeves would give me a, a time at the end of class to do jokes and stuff like that. <laughs> Because I was always getting in trouble, but I was smart too. So I would finish my work. I'd be sitting there with my, you know, make a noise or something. She's like, okay, uh-uh, <laughs> uh-uh. So I'm gonna give you time at the end of class, and I would watch the Tonight Show. So I'd watch Johnny Carson, and you know, and yet, did you know that uh, earlier today it was so hot? So I would watch all the Johnny Carson and watch, you know, David Brenner and all the different acts that would mm -hmm. come on there, and I would just use those jokes for my jokes. Well, hold on. The, some of those jokes weren't meant for school. I know, but, but here's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> here's the thing. It was only one TV in my house, and it was in the room I slept. So my grandmother had to watch Johnny Carson, so I had to watch Johnny Carson, too. So that's how I got, you know, Lola Falana and all the different... Remember Lola Falana would be on? Give it up for Lola Falana. And it was just amazing. So I would take those jokes. And you know what's crazy about Johnny Carson? Sitting on the couch. We used to, if you sat on the couch, you made it. Remember yep. that? Yeah. And that was a singer. I don't know if you remember. His, his name was Joe Williams. Dark, tall. Mm -hmm. Remember Joe Williams? And if I would be sure that someday you would find. And if I would be no. Right? <laughs> Thank you. But here's the thing, Joe never got a chance to sit on the couch, right? My grandma said, ooh, I wish one day, I wish that Jesus would just let Joe, <laughs> I wish Jesus would let Joe sit on that couch with Johnny Carson. He sunk so well for so many years. Mm. 
So we sit there, and every every time Joe will come on, we sit like, okay, maybe Joe, will, maybe Joe will sit on the couch today, right? So Joe is singing, and if I would, once again I sung a song I haven't sat on the couch, <laughs> but maybe tonight, right? And I guess someone had canceled. Mm -hmm. So Johnny Carson says, come on, sit on the couch, Joe. We was like, yeah! <laughs> but Joe went to run over there because he was so excited. And the microphone cord was tied around his foot. <laughs> and Joe fell. <laughs> <laughs> And Joe was like trying to get to the couch. And Joe was trying to get to the couch. And then they went to commercial. <laughs> we were like, damn, Joe. <laughs> that hurt me. That hurt my grandmother. I like, <laughs> just can't believe Joe was so close. <laughs> they went to commercial on Joe's ass. You, 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 always talk, you always talk about your grandmother so yeah. much, and, and she, she has given you, it seems like, an incredible sense of confidence. She, she was, because that was my rock. Like, I was adopted, yo, so, like, I didn't, you know, I didn't have, like, once my adopted brother left. And she also adopted my mom. Wow. So it was amazing. She adopted my mom, and then she adopted me. My mom was, like, how do you say? My mom was fly. She was young and fly. And, you know, she just didn't have time, I guess, or whatever the circumstance was. I didn't know. I was seven months, so I just knew. I knew my mom. But my mom who adopted me, I, that was the one wow. who cared for me. Yeah. And sometimes I would go, I would go, you know, I would go stay with my mom every once in a while. And she was just, you know, she was in the fast lane, you know. And mm -hmm. I never forget looking, you know, back then they had the photo albums. So I was at her apartment one time. I just opened the photo album. I said, there go my mom right there with one of the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> now flipped it. Oh, there she is with one of the Mavericks of basketball. <laughs> so I was like, wait a minute, what's my, you know, it was, she was fly. Yeah. She was saying she was in the fast lane. So she was doing her thing. So, so then my grandmother would always just make sure, you know, I had everything that I, that I needed. And she was like, even when it came to like fights in the neighborhood, because my grandmother was like Tyler Perry's my dear. That's my grandmother. She didn't play. And so I'll never forget one time, this dude named Bill English. Damn. Two years older than me. You remember that day, two years older than me was serious. Yep. So I'm walking over to the little field where they play football, and Bill English said, let's punch. I said, huh? <laughs> let's box. I said, all right, whatever. But if you hit me, my brother's going to shoot you with a BB gun. I said, well, that narrows the odds. <laughs> <laughs> What does that mean? And I knew his, his brother the same age as me. I'm like, kid, he's like, man, I can't, I can't help him, man. I got to shoot you. <laughs> if he says I got to shoot you, I got to shoot you. So I remember just being upset by that. And I, you know, I was outside. I didn't want to tell my grandmother what happened. So I was just outside crying loud. <laughs> yeah, you know, Boy, what's wrong with you? I said, Bill, <laughs> he says he hit me in a BB gun. I didn't even get it all out. So when I told her what happened, she said, let's go. I said, where are we going? We're going to Bill English house. And she put that Moo Moo dress on. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what that Moo Moo dress is? Yeah, people know what that, that Moo Moo dress is. just sort of looks go all the way down. And the Moo Moo dress would swing like this when she walked. You know why it swung like that? It was a pistol in that Moo Moo dress. <laughs> and she walked down there and knocked on Bill's house on the, on the, on the, on the door and said, hey, we're not going to have no problems. Not with this one. Because this one is promised. This one is chosen. She would always say that. I ain't know what you're talking about. She said, no, you're not going to do that with him. And so, you know, she sort of went in the neighborhood and made sure I was able to have the upbringing I had, I play football. Yeah, you you were quarterback. Play quarterback. And, 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 uh, and then... Threw like, for a thousand yards. I huh? threw for a thousand yards in, in high school. Had a lot of interceptions, though, but I was there. <laughs> 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 I was terrible, though, because I had my stats... Like in my, I was one of those dudes. Wait a minute, oh, I need two more passes. <laughs> I was, I was terrible. I, my head was so big, cause you know Texas was all a football. It was everything yeah. about football. So when I played, you know, like I was, I passed for a thousand yards, but I was, I was sloppy with it. But you know, speaking speaking of football and 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 speaking of, of movie. Oh, and I gotta say this before I go, about my mom. I don't want to paint a bad picture, 
because I would always send my mom, once I got on, mm -hmm. I would always send my mom tickets, plane tickets, to come see me on Christmas. And she would never come, right? Until about, I would say now, nine, ten years ago, I sent her a plane ticket. She calls and says, I'm coming. She shows up. We have a fantastic time. And then days went by. New Year's, which is her birthday. Mm -hmm. Had a great time. Next thing you know, it's January 16th. I said, Mom, what, you know, what's, what's good? You, you, <laughs> you, what, what are you, you chilling? Well, I mean, if, I mean, am I invited? I said, man, of course. Of course you are. And she started living with me about 10 years ago. And so she's lived with me along with my stepfather, who she was married to 25, she got divorced 25, maybe 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And he was the one that taught me how to throw the football and all that kind of stuff. So they, they've been divorced for 30 years, but they both live in my house. Now. <laughs> now. Now. Right now. They're at the crib right now. It's crazy because he still dates. And you know, she's, you know, they get messy. So like, <laughs> so he'll have, he'll have somebody at the house and she'll go on his side of the house because, oh, I just need to get something out of the refrigerator. I said, mom, it's a refrigerator. I need to get something out of the refrigerator. <laughs> so she go on his side just to see the girl. Hey, how, okay, how you, mm, that's what we doing, huh? Okay. Mmm, <laughs> mmm, I'm gonna go in the refrigerator. Mmm, something spoiled in here, mmm. <laughs> I guess there's a lot of spoiled food around here. And then my, then my pops would come to my room, come to my room like, I said, what's up? Uh, 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 could you tell her to stay off my side of the house? <laughs> I said, now adults. <laughs> and that's been 10 years. 10 years. 10 years. And so they, we, all, we all lived together. It all came together. It all made sense. We lived together. It's love. And, you know, it worked out. I'm, I'm learning stuff about Jamie I had no idea about. I, I really am. Yeah, and and you, speaking of football, right? And speaking of movies, yeah. uh, Willie Beeman. Yeah. Any My given Sunday, you. that character, part of that seems like it was you. A lot, a lot of it was me because it, any given Sunday was a, an incredible moment because I was doing the Jamie Foxx show, and they were getting ready to cancel us before... 100 episodes. So I was like, man, please. And then Any Given Sunday came up, and I went in to read for Oliver Stone. Everybody know Oliver Stone, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read for Oliver Stone. And when I read for Oliver Stone, he says, well, you're just no good. I was like, what? You're no good. You're no good. He told you that. He tells me this to my face. You're no good. And I was like, what? what yeah, it's no good. And then, because the, I, I read for, I don't know what, I read for one of the running backs. Or something. It was a, just a part yeah. I was reading for. I said, yeah. you're no good. And, and then the, the, the casting lady said, why don't you come back and read for something else? It, yeah, yeah, he could. And as I walked away, Oliver Stone says this, so I could hear it as he's writing something down. Jamie Foxx, slave to television. Oh. And I'm, I'm heated. I walk out, I say, yeah, and then he said something about I was a slave and picking cotton and something. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, I added on to it. Yeah, 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 I think he called me someone, some kind of name out my name. And he's like, Jay, just really like, no, no, fuck it, no. I hate Oliver Stone, right? And then they had me come back and read for another part, for the part of the agent. And I read, and after I did that, he says, well, you're just no good at that either. And I'm like, so I... Well, I, how did you, but how did, how do you hear that and, and stick with it? It wrecks you, but what it does is it lets you know what you got. Because I left and I said, Fuck him, I'm never gonna do this. Da, 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 da. And I called my agent. I was on In Living Color, and I was the greatest on there. And I was, he doesn't know who I am. I'm Jamie Foxx. And they were like, Yeah, Jay, but In Living Color was on a cool network. It wasn't a bit network. And Warner Brothers is, is okay now. So not a lot of people know who you are. And so next thing you know, I actually get a call back. You got the part of the agent. So when I get, when I go back, I said, I'm gonna let him know how I feel. So when I, walk, when I walked in there, I said, I'm going to tell you something, man. So what is it? And he was all relaxed. I said, man, you disrespect me, man. You understand what I'm doing, man. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get this. He says, relax. He says, you're good, but you are a slave to television because you're loud. 
Because on TV, we have to, hey, man, how you feel today? All right, then, so and so. He says, movies are like this. And if you act like that on the movie, on that big screen, it's going to be too much. Overwhelming. I said, okay. He said, now, so I got a problem. I said, what's the problem? He says, the person who I wanted to play the quarterback is not working out. I need to find somebody who can play the quarterback. I said, I happen to, I played quarterback in high school. <laughs> I passed over 1,000 yards. <laughs> I didn't tell him about the interception. <laughs> and I said, listen, I don't want to step on nobody's toes. I said, but I can get that. So during that time, I started learning my lines. And every time I came in, he was like, you're terrible. You stink. You got, you got to be the person. You're trying to act like you're being the person. You have to get it. And this is what I learned about a true director. This was a good training for me. So. What I did was I got all my homies together. Remember that 97 coupe, the Mercedes? Absolutely. I, I rented, a, 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 got somebody's coupe to drive around. So I had somebody film me in the coupe, and I get out in all my, my, my football gear like we're at training camp. And so I'm throwing, you know, like literally, I'm throwing passes, outs, and whatever. And I came up with this little chant. My name is Willie. Willie Beeman. I keep the ladies <laughs> creaming. And all my fans got them screaming. Think you can defeat me? You're dreaming. Dream it, yeah. So we did a little, I had a little music set up. I did a little beat and put that together and made this tape, gave it to Oliver Stone. Got hired. Yeah. And that's how I... So, so, so it actually, it's, it's a lesson in perseverance. It's a lesson you that if somebody, to. you don't hear what you need to hear, you make it what you want to hear. Exactly. And, and, and you know it because you had a coach who oh, told yeah. you, Mike, you gotta, you have to give more than the next guy. But he said it in a different way. But, <laughs> yeah. but you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're used to coaches. I'm used to a coach. My high school coach was like this. So Oliver Stone was exemplifying something I had already seen before. So just didn't know it was coming like that. Now, once I became Willie Beeman, there was a trip. It was a trip. He would shoot first team. The first unit means you shoot during the day or shoot at night. We were shooting at night. But then second unit was shoot during the day. I would work all night, sleep for a couple of hours, and then go to second unit and put a mic on so I could do my own stunts just because I didn't want to get cut out of the movie because it was so many different storylines that he was mm -hmm. trying to follow. So I was doing double duty, making sure that there's no way he can cut me out this, out, out, out this film. And, 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 and I, was, I was like coming up with different things. I said, Oliver, did you, did you see what I did on second unit? So it started going you know, my way as far, far as the character. And to be on, on the set with Warren Moon, yeah. I learned from Warren Moon. Like he taught me about how to be the suave, sort of brash black quarterback. You know? And then there was Dick Buckus, and it was- it Lawrence was Taylor. Lawrence Taylor. Man, LT. Man, LT was on there, man. Yeah. And, and Jim and Rebel, Brian. LT was amazing because he actually got hired after someone fell out, and LT comes in, no pre preparation or anything, but he was that guy. Mm -hmm. He was that, and he made you feel it. And and it was a funny story too, because LT, you know, he's retired. He, but did, 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 he he scares me. He's look, he. <laughs> listen, no, I love him. I, listen, I love him, but he he just scared me to LT death. LT scared everybody. But come on, man, I got to go play golf, man. Let's get this thing done, man. Why we out here for all these hours? Oliver, come on, man. And you know, everybody was like, you know, Oliver was like, is it okay to toss it? Yeah, you know, so Oliver was crazy too. But there was a thing that happened on that movie, I gotta tell you, it really became a team because LT was doing some type of stunt where he's supposed to, you know, hit the, hit the running back in, in, in the hole. And it was Ricky Waters. Mm -hmm. Great player. Great player. So Ricky Waters was coming through the line. Doo -doo -doo -doo. And hitting LT. Hey, 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 Rick, hey, Ricky man. Hey man, don't do that no more. <laughs> hey man, I'm retired, man. Hey man, this is a movie, Rick man. Yeah, whatever, whatever, man. Get this. And then everybody was like, yo, down on the other end of the field, yo, yo, Lawrence and, and Rick getting into it. So Lawrence was like, you wanna feel this? <laughs> Rick was like, whatever, man, whatever you got, old man. And it's and I was like, I was like, I was like, this is crazy. And so Lauren said, man, uh, don't make me, I'm, I'm shooting blanks right now, don't make me shoot these live bullets. <laughs> <laughs> he said, don't make me shoot these live bullets. <laughs> I said, what is that? Yeah. 
So everybody left what they was doing to come see them run this play. Man, Ricky Waters came through there, and LT lit him up, and it was Tylenol martinis for the rest of the night. <laughs> he knocked him out, though. He was out. You know how they bring yeah. the water hose, and it was on. I said, Rick, you okay? The hose smelling stuff? <laughs> <laughs> LT was on his way to go play golf. I told your ass. <laughs> stop messing with me now. <laughs> but you, you talked about when you, you, this role and you just wanted to get it. And you went on in some other roles. You definitely got Bundini Brown and Ali. Yeah. Amazing, man. Thank you. Amazing. I have to thank Will Smith for that. Because Will Smith was getting ready to play the most iconic person in our, you know, pretty much in our history. Mm -hmm. And so Will told Michael Mann, who was a serious director, serious, and I didn't know Michael Mann. I didn't know that he was like another, another hard director, mm -hmm. a person who definitely has, and that's what I got accustomed to, working with Oliver Stone, but I didn't know he was that. So Will says, I won't do the movie unless Fox is in the movie. That's huge in Hollywood. Oh, wow. I'm indebted to that guy for the rest of so my were, life. So were you tight with him at the time? I, I, you know, it wasn't that I was tight. With him, it's just he, he saw something in me that said, this could make, this could make the difference. Mm -hmm. And so Michael Mann says, listen, I don't want to have to worry about you as well. <laughs> and you come in and you do the character. I already have him to worry about. I want you to have the character or you're out of here. So I was like, snap. I went and learned Bundini Brown. I learned that his, his underbite was the most important thing about his speech. It was this. And when I learned that, that's when the character came, because Bundini had, his, his lines were, Muhammad Ali's a prophet, how are you going to be God's son? But he had a little bit of a list. Muhammad Ali's a prophet, how are you going to be God's son? As soon as you come out the garage, you beat number two. <laughs> so I had to learn and get Bundini so I wouldn't get fired. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't get fired, and I wanted to be solid for Will, because he has such a big thing to do. Now... In, in, in getting the character, here's where my expertise of doing stand-up and knowing my audience, because mm -hmm. I started out doing comedy in all of the black clubs and all of the, uh, you know, the, the, the hoods, you know? I, I know that. I know that a movie works for our character come through the hood first and then out to mainstream. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand what I'm saying right now, but I'll make, make it Well, they say urban to suburban. Yeah, it has, it has to go through us. So Bundini is the quintessential urban character. Mm -hmm. So he has to come through that door first. So at one point, Michael Mann said, I, I want you to come in. Uh, Bundini comes in, he sees Ali, and he's afraid of him. Now, mind you, I don't know. I didn't know Michael Mann was the type. I said, why would, why would he be afraid of him? Because he's Ali. I said, yeah, but black people ain't afraid of other black people. <laughs> That's not actually what I said. I said the N-word. <laughs> I said, English ain't, ain't scared of other niggas. Right? And he didn't understand it. What did you say? I said, oh, man, that's just the way I talk. Listen, now what I'm saying is black people ain't afraid of other black people. Like, if I see a star out, that, hey, that's, I made him, I think. It's Ali. And you do what I say, do. You, you, you come in and you're scared. I said, cool, I'll do it. So the first thing I go in, I'm like, oh, Mr. Ali, yeah, do. <laughs> All right, so I'm like, man, I'm going like, man, this ain't, this ain't how I go, right? So that day goes by, and then we're, on, we're shooting in Miami, and Michael Mann, and we're shooting this thing, we're out on the street, right? And this white family came up to me very nice and quiet. Mr. Fox, is it okay if we get a picture of my self and my kids would like to get a picture. And I was like, oh, man, sure. It's quiet and nice family. Nice, quiet family. <laughs> so I take the picture, right, and they leave. Ten minutes later, it's a brother across the street <laughs> see me like, Fox, what up, baby? <laughs> Fox, what's popping with it, man? Hold on. And he's walking across the street. Ah, hold on, man. You see me walking through here, man? Hey, Fox, what up? He comes up to me, Fox, what up, baby? How you doing, man? I said, what's up, man? He said, hey, man, what y'all doing tonight, dog? Where y'all going? Where y'all going tonight? And Michael Mann says, you know him? I said, I don't know who this is. <laughs> <laughs> well, how he know you? I just told you black people ain't scared of other black people. <laughs> 
<laughs> and, then, and then he said, and the dude says, he said, what y'all doing, Fox? I said, man, we doing this movie, Ali. That's the director. Man, you the director, dog. I have been trying to get on as a director. Look. <laughs> He said, he said, hey, is it a number I could call? A number or something that I could call to get my director? Hold on, man. Let me get a pen so I can get your number, dog. So I get my director. Y'all got a pen or something? <laughs> Jamie Foxx, I know you got a pen, dog. I said, man, this is crazy. After Michael Mann saw that on Everything I Love, we went back and we reshot the scene. Wow. Wow. We reshot the scene. And what I explained to Mike was Bundini is a charlatan as well. He's also magical to Ali because everybody, you know this as well, as an athlete, there's some guys that you just keep around because yeah. that's my homie here in the corner saying, let's get him, Mike. <laughs> Shake that off, Mike. And he, people would think he serves no purpose to you, but you know if he ain't there on Sunday. You feel it. You feel it. And I said, he trying to get a job, so he had to make Ali feel like you need me. Mm -hmm. And once we implemented that, that's when that, that that character really came to life and you saw what you what you saw which was great greatness man greatness and um i mean i'll be honest with you i i had all these questions i didn't know why i brought them out here <laughs> but I, I do have you know you you oh you have some some, some audience questions we're not gonna get to all these you know that um <laughs> but 2004 collateral big movie ray Michael Mann again. Michael Mann again, and then Ray. Yeah. I can't believe 2004 already, first of all. Yeah. Now, now, when it comes to Ray, you won an Academy Award, you won the BAFTA, yeah. you won all these things I yeah. said earlier, but I'm sure you've told so many stories about Ray, but is there one story you haven't told about that experience with that movie that you could possibly share? Well, just, just meeting Ray Charles was amazing. Um, when Ray Charles seemingly walks towards you as if he can see because this was just how cool and how fly he was. And again, you know, I, I'm nervous and I'm like, Mr. Charles, I, I, I just want to do the best I can uh, as portraying you. And he goes, hey, hey, let me tell you something, baby. <laughs> if you could play the blues, man, you could do anything. Let's go play the blues. And we sat down and we got on dual pianos and we just played the blues. Were you nervous? I was nervous as hell. <laughs> but, and while we were playing, he was getting into it, and then he changed into some Thelonious Monk. So I'm trying to, you know, that's intricate. I'm trying to stay up with him, and all of a sudden I hit a wrong note. And he goes, hey, hey, what, why the hell would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said, I, I, I'm sorry? Why would, and his ears are so sensitive that he could hear the note. And he says something to me that I still take to, to heart every day. He says, hey, you know what? Life is notes underneath your fingers, man. You just, you just got to take the right, you got to take the time to play the right notes, baby. So we started playing again. I get the right notes. I get it right. He jumps up and says, the kids got it. And he walked out. So that was like mind blowing. So you got you. So you, you got his, you got his seal of approval. I got his seal of approval. Then I had to go get him because that was the old Ray Charles. So how do you, I mean, how do you learn to, to, to do what you do? Because you do impressions from the acting side to just the voices. The voices to me would seem easier. I can't do anybody, but it would seem easier to do just the voice than to do the body language, the if, everything. If you do the voice, that's one thing, but you have to have... Like, like an impersonation is one thing, but I needed to know what Ray Charles was, not at seven years old. I needed to know him at 19. So I went to Quincy Jones's house. And I went, and, hey man, what's going on, man? Shit, yeah, you're doing Ray Charles, man. It's gonna be great, man. Man, I'm telling you, man, you can do it, man. Ray, Ray was a son of a bitch, man. He was amazing. <laughs> He was the son of a bitch, man. He was ahead of all of us, man. He taught us all how to do music, man. I said, well, well Quincy, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to find his voice, his young voice. Well, hold on, man. Let me go in here. Let me go in here in the room. You see on the, on the wall there, Jamie, that's, that's the Thriller album. That's 54 million records, man, me and Michael. <laughs> <laughs> he dropped that on me as we walking through his house. <laughs> fell like, what? So he comes out and gives me a cassette tape. 
I said, what's this? He said, hey, man, it's something on there with Ray and something. I know it's a couple of things on there. Just listen to the cassette tape. I'm like, where am I going to find a cassette player? player yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to lease a truck from like Hertz Rent-A-Car or something like that. <laughs> that still had the cassette tape, so I popped it in, and what I heard was, hi, this is Donna Shore from the Donna Shore Show with two very wonderful musicians, and Mr. Kenny Rogers and Mr. Ray Charles. And you hear Ray, hey, you know what, Donna, I'm just so happy to be here. Uh, you know, and the fact that you know my music is just amazing. And I was like, wow, that's it. And then she said something like, talk about the drugs, Ray, because you're promoting your book. And there was a pause for like three or four seconds. And Ray began to stutter. Wait, wait, you know, I, I, uh, and so I took that as DNA, that in the movie when Ray was met with real life, things that he had messed up, whether it's his wife or his kids, I make him stutter. You know, I, I, I don't want, but when he was about his music, he was complete. So all of those different tools I used, and then here comes the grandmother the piano is going to take you across the tracks. The director said, I only got one problem. I said, what's that? If I shoot you, I have to shoot you up here and then find someone else who knows how to play and shoot your hands. I said, you're in luck, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. And we learned, we learned all of the fingering and everything on the piano so it could all rest in, in one shot. And then the rest was uh, history. And, and what, I, what I did learn with that experience, I learned perseverance. Mm -hmm. I learned how to, how to work through it. And then we went on, uh, but I had to learn another lesson. And that lesson was how to act when, I, when things were going my way. Because when we were nominated for the Oscars, I was wilding out a little bit, mm -hmm. a little bit too much. The Oscars was in February, but in November, I was acting a fool. I was going there, man, we nominated, dog. I'm going to the clubs and just making it really sort of bad. I remember I went to one award show, and I was messed up doing all this on the red carpet, like really, really not representing myself right. And, and my publicist says, you want to take a look at yourself on the red carpet? <laughs> <laughs> He says, is this what we really trying to do? Sis? because you're going to blow it. I said, come on, man. Shit, I'm just having a good time, dog. We ain't going to win that shit. No way, man. Come on, let's just have a good time, man. You trying to cut me down on my good time, man. I, I'm nominated for the Oscar, man. Recognize in here, man, all that. I'm all, I'm all in Miami partying, fighting. And my, my publicist says, listen, I don't think you understand. You're going to mess around and lose this. I said, man, does it really matter? Hmm. I said, man, it ain't going to give it to me. No. He, said, he, says, he says, you know what? Forget it. And I get a call. From? From a lady. Hi, Jamie Foxx. Oh. Uh, it was Oprah Winfrey. The big O, yeah. I said, hello. Hi, Jamie Foxx. <laughs> I said, who this? It's Oprah Winfrey, Jamie Foxx. <laughs> what are you doing, Jamie Foxx? You're blowing it, Jamie Foxx. And I said, um, what? She says, listen, you're blowing it. And I said, and she says, I want to I wanna make you understand why it's important for you to win because Ray is a decent character. It's a redemptive character. We need you to understand how important it is. Mm -hmm. I, I said, yeah. I, 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 he says, she said, listen, I'm going to take you somewhere. I'm going to have you pick, picked up in a week. I'm taking you somewhere so you understand its significance. And she took me back to Quincy Jones's house. And when I go to Quincy Jones's house, every actor, black actor from the 60s and the 70s <laughs> was there to greet me and make me understand how important the moment was. I saw people that I worshipped wow. as actors standing there. Some of them hadn't acted in 20 years, probably borrowed a suit and says, I'm counting on you. I'm counting on you. Right? And at one point, Quincy Jones was like, yeah, yeah, man, you're out there fucking it up. <laughs> can, I say, can I say what he said? Man, you're out there fucking it up, Jamie. That's not what we're doing, man. And I was like, I was just having a good time. So, well, you know, it's, it's significant. And then Oprah grabbed me and says, you want to see the person that you come here to see? I said, yeah, he's right there. It was Sidney Poitier. And standing there in a tuxedo was Sidney Poitier. <laughs> I 
just went, I'm they sorry. Were like, they were like, go. <laughs> Put one foot in front of the other. And when I got there, Sidney Porteous said, I saw you one time. <laughs> you were at a party. Do you remember that? I was like, yes. I want to talk to you. I said, what, what is this? I want to give you something. I give you responsibility. And I was like, yeah. he says, when I saw your performance, I grew two inches. It's important. And after that night, I got myself together. I, my little daughter came with me mm -hmm. to the Oscars. My little 10-year-old, Karen, came, and we sat there after Oprah had once again put her arms around the whole situation, made it right, and I'm sitting there with my daughter, not the craziness that I was about to do. And then my daughter goes, just as they're about to say my name, says, even if you don't win, Dad, you're still a great actor. And they call out my name, and I go up, and y'all remember? Oprah was like, <laughs> that's how you do it, Jamie Foxx! <laughs> I mean, I, I mean I'm, I'm, taken, I'm taken back by these stories, man. Honestly, I feel like I should pay you for sitting here listening to this. <laughs> nah, I, I mean, this, this, is, this is phenomenal. I mean, this is a lot of stuff I didn't expect. And, um... I have so much in these cards, but you forget my cards. I'm going to ask some questions from our audience. We have someone who, who's written some things down here. And the first one is from Thebra. Is that right? Probably? OK. If you could give yourself advice at 20 years old, what would you say? All right. Put the weed out. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Put that down. You don't We're need learning a lot. You're going to mess your lips up. <laughs> if I could give myself I I advice at 20, <sighs> it it it's hard to say because at 20, 21, I was just getting on in living color. And I guess it would be to. <sighs> Uh, save your money. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was I was only getting six thousand. Like I only I was getting thirty five thousand dollars. <laughs> what in the <laughs> What in the hell is going I on? I told y'all right? it ain't that kind of show. Look at it. <laughs> okay, let me see. No, this is from you. I see it right here. From you. Meet me in the back. What? <laughs> Trying to get them. <laughs> Trying to get them student loans paid, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Save my money. Save your money. Okay. Here's another question. If you could play an historic figure, if you could play an historic figure you haven't already played, who would it be and why? Wow. Historic figure. I, I, um, we have an opportunity to, to play Marvin Gaye. Um, and Marvin oh. Gaye is significant. Uh, the reason being my connection with Marvin Gaye is interesting because when I was 18, my, my, uh, uh, my uncle, who was assistant chief of police, knew that I wanted to be in music, so he had me go meet Harvey Fuqua in L.A. And Harvey Fuqua was the last manager for Marvin Gaye. And I thought he was joking, but when I got there, it was in Brentwood, and on the mailbox says, Freeman Gay and Fuqua, and Harvey Fuqua came to the door and said, you the one to sing? I said, big, tall, big, tall, black guy. I said, yeah. He said, come on in. And when I walked in, he said, you see that over there? I said, yeah, it's a keyboard and a real to real. That's not any keyboard and real to real. That's Marvin Gaye's keyboard and real to real. And I sat down and started playing, and he's the one who discovered me, actually. So he would have me come over and play all the Marvin Gaye stuff, you know, which was a little strange because, you know, Marvin had just passed away. So we sort of, he was sort of missing Marvin. I said, hey, man, I hope I'm not being too weird, but, you know, I just, I want to do my own thing, right? And he was like, yeah, yeah, I apologize. So I became his assistant. And when I became his assistant, I would do like his filing and stuff because I didn't have nowhere to stay. So I would just stay on his couch, do his filing. And then at one point, talk about cassette tapes, 
I'm putting all his cassette tapes in order, listening to them and sort of putting them together. And I pull out a cassette tape and I put it in. I said, what is this? It was the master for sexual healing. Mm. I wake him up that morning. Yo, man, you got, it was like four in the morning. Yo, you got to tell me about this. He said, what? I said, you got to tell I said, man, he said, I got a whole bunch of those tapes. I said, well, how did y'all come up with sexual healing, man? How y'all do that? He says, actually, we were in the studio four or five in the morning, and we're working, and the track is playing, and, and Marvin is just sort of like, you know, doing whatever he does. I, and I told him, I said, Marvin, let's go, man. It's late. W wait, Fuke. No, Marvin, let's go, man. Come on, let's go. He said, Fuke, where's, uh, where's Marilyn, Fuke? She's laying right here on the couch, man. She's asleep. Marvin goes, get up, Marilyn. Wake up, Marilyn. Marilyn, get up. Wake up, Marilyn. Harvey goes, hold on a second. Keep saying that. Get up. Wake up, Marilyn. And then finally, boom, get up, get up. Um, 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 um. Wake up, wake up, wake up. That's how that, so I know that story. Wow. <laughs> I got, I, I don't know what it is. I got stories. That's, that's, I'm going back out on stand-up, so if you get a chance to you check You know what? That was my, I was going to give you a yes or no question. It's been over decades since your last stand-up. Any plans of return? Yeah, I'm going, I'm going out. That's why... Thank you. Yeah. That's why I'm so that's why I'm so on right now cuz I've been in the gym like in the in the stand up gym like in my crib like cuz I can't go out and do all of it so any chance I get I drop little bits of it because the stand up is going to be called I got stories. And so it's basically all of the stories that has happened to me along with, you know, some topical stuff that's going on in my life. So this summer, I'm going to go out and I'm going to go to all the comedy clubs that I hit when I first started. So I'm going to hit them clubs and it'd be pop up. So I don't know how you are on your social media, but if you follow me on I Am Jamie Foxx, I will, I will say, boom, I'm going to be here in the next two weeks or boom, I'm coming this day. So I don't so I could just sort of like do it organically. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I follow you, but can you like text yeah, me? Yeah, I got you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be out line. I'm here to see Jamie. I just, I need to hook up, man. I got you, man. But yeah. And, and um, uh, two quick things. One, somebody has a Willie Beeman jersey. They want to know if you will sign it. Of course. All right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and to the last question, which was the one that was thrown up on stage by, by Suzanne. Suzanne, there she is, right there, Suzanne. All right, Suzanne wants to know, what was the best thing that happened to you today besides meeting all of them? Oh. You know what? This is the best thing that happened to me today. <laughs> Mr. Fox, we, we, we are, we're well over our time that we were supposed to be out here. But I think it was a treat, and we are honored that Jamie stayed a little bit later to do this. And, and I think we got a we got a we got a chance we got a chance to witness we got a chance to witness why this man is as successful as he is in his career. And I encourage everybody. Thursday, beat Shazam, check him out, watch him do his thing, and support him in everything he does because there are very few people who are talented in this and deserve it. So give it up for Jamie.